Hello everybody. So this is my new video. It's going to be um, a bit of a long one and the reason for that is I don't want to break it up because it's all about the same topic and it's quite a deep dive into the prophecies of Daniel chapter 7 to the end of the book and before we can get too deep into this we have to study a period of history where a lot of these events took place and what the prophecy is pointing to. It's pointing straight at a certain period of history and that period is uh, in the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean um, from about maybe 300 BC to about 100 AD. That period of history is the end of, of early antiquity or late antiquity and uh, the beginning of the Roman Empire. Um, so we're going to take a look at the history surrounding that and we're going to come up with a little list of possible top or possible subjects for this for this prophecy and and who is this little horn uh, this power that rises. Um, so we're going to look at the history first. Now before we do that I hope you will like and subscribe to this channel, like the video, and hit the notification bell so that you'll get notified when I put out a new video. Uh, my video output's going to be a bit sporadic right now because I'm taking uh, uh, university courses online and uh, some of these courses are a bit tough and I'm, I have a lot of studying to do and uh, I just can't be consistent with my videos for a while yet. Um, so let's get started. Now the history period that we're going to take a look at is uh, starting with the Diadoshi. These are the four kingdoms that came out of Alexander the Great's empire. Alexander the Great swept through here. He took over from here. He started in Macedonia and he conquered all the way through here. He conquered all the, into Egypt and he conquered all the way out to here and then he died. And he didn't leave an heir. So his four generals had a meeting and they carved up his empire. And this is how it ended up. The yellow part here is called the Seleucid Empire. And uh, the, the um, blue part here, including the island of Cyprus and this little piece of Asia Minor up here, this is um, part of Egypt, but it's called Ptolemic Egypt because Ptolemy was the general who got this part and from him on it's the Greek leaders, the Greek pharaohs of Egypt called Tol the Ptolemic period and this is the Greek leaders in here and this here part, this part of, uh, of Thrace and Western Asia Minor was, was uh, run by Lysander, one of the generals. And then this part here, Macedonia, was run by Cassander, one of the generals. So there's the four pieces, the green, the brown, the yellow, and the purple. Now here's Rome here. See at this time, Italy, Rome was this big. It was a kingdom the size of Italy. And as we know, they were at war with uh, Carthage over here. The Carthage, Carthaginian Empire. Now these, uh, Carthage, this was a settlement settled by the Phoenicians, apparently. And they own these islands up here and all this and the part of the north coast of Africa and even into Sicily. You can see where they invaded Sicily. So Rome was at war here with Carthage. 
Okay, so this is the size of Rome right here. This is the Roman Roman kingdom. Okay. So now let's get started with our history. See about uh, say about starting about 215 BC. We're going to talk about the first Macedonian War. That was a war between Macedonia and Rome. Okay, Philip V of Macedon, because Rome was preoccupied with the war with Carth Carthage, Philip V of Macedon, he decided to expand westward. So he spent the, wil the winter in 217, 216 BC. He built a fleet of 100 warships. And in 215, he entered an alliance with Hannibal of Carthage. The, so Philip Macedonia enters an alliance with Hannibal of Carthage against Rome. Okay. Now on their way back to Macedon, Philip's uh, ambassadors who were making this deal, they were captured by the commander of the Roman fleet and the agreement with them. So the Roman fleet was doubled to 50 warships to protect the east coast of Italy because of Italy, they were afraid that they were going to invade along with Macedonians. And then from 2014 until 2012, Rome was at war with Philip in this area here, in the eastern coast of Macedonia, right? Now Rome, in 2011, Rome made a, 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 a treaty with the, Alito with the Aetolian League, which is a league of these Macedonian uh, little principal states in Macedonia, and also Asia Minor. And Rome and Pergamum, controlled the sea while the treaty created a war between the Greeks between these guys and these guys because this is all Greek people right the brown and the green part so they started a civil war or warring with each other so while they were busy Rome and Pergamum Pergamum's up here somewhere they controlled the sea now in 205 BC, there's a peace treaty ending the war at Phoenice. And, it, and, and the part of the treaty was that Philip broke his treaty with Hannibal. He, he got out of that alliance. So as long as he got out of the alliance, then it made peace with these guys. Okay. Or Macedonia is in a peace treaty with Rome regarding um, peace here with these guys and no war with these guys or no alliance with these guys. Okay, so that was the first Macedonian War and it ended up with Philip being kind of constrained into a treaty by Rome in order to stop the war with these guys. Because Rome was in a treaty with these guys. Now, if we backtrack a little bit, we're going to look at a bit of the Seleucid and the Egyptian history. In 230 BC, the Seleucids, they mo went against to conquer Egypt. You see here, they, f they were fighting over Israel. They were also fighting over this. They wanted to conquer these parts and Egypt. So Ptolemy the fourth was succeeded by Ptolemy the fifth, and Ptolemy the fifth was five years old. So he had regents uh, running the empire, and they saw this as weakness. The, the Seleucids saw that as weakness, so they w went in to try to conquer Egypt while it was weak. So seeing this weakness, 
the Seleucids and Macedon made a treaty together to conquer Egypt and divide it between them. So Rome sent Philip an, in Macedon, Rome sent him an ultimatum that he cease hostilities against Egypt because Egypt was an ally of Rome because Egypt was uh, a great supplier of grain and some probably some other commodities but mostly grain and um, they were already in alliance so Philip ignored Rome and Rome sent an army of Ro of Romans and Greek allies against Philip in Macedon. So in 197 BC, Philip is defeated and he, he looks for peace. And Philip, in the treaty, Philip was forbidden from interfering with kingdoms beyond his borders and uh, some of the Greek states that were already under his control were, were set free. Okay? And it's called the, uh, Rome called that treaty the freedom of the Greeks. And that was uh, Rome's policy from that time on, was Greek freedom was a part of their policy. Spreading freedom around the world, right? <laughs> So Rome withdrew from Greece and said, as long as you guys can abide with each other and not bother anyone else, then we will leave you alone. So when Rome withdrew from, from interfering with these nations, then the Seleucids saw that Egypt and Macedon were weakened by this because Rome withdrew from there. And Hannibal of Carthage, he was the chief mili military advisor to these guys, the Seleucids. And, and he planned, Hannibal, they planned together to take Greece and Rome out. So Carthage wanted Rome, Seleucids wanted Greece. Okay. Now, when they heard this, when the Romans heard about this and the Greeks, there was a major Greek and Roman mobilization under Scipio Africanus. And the Romans crossed the Hellespont. Where's the Hellespont? It's right here, right? Or right here? Right here is the crossing to cross this waterway here. So they crossed into Asia Minor. And this is the first time Rome's crossing into Asia Minor. And the Battle of Magnesia against Antiochus III up in here to take this area. And Rome's, Romans won the decisive victory in that battle. And they came up with the Treaty of Apamea in 188 BC and they gave up all lands west of the Tarsus Mountains. The Tarsus Mountains are somewhere in this area so all lands west of that were given up to the Romans and they and Seleucid Empire had to send 20 hostages to Rome which would be the king's family and, and their, their heirs that Rome would hold as as uh, part of the treaty, and and they would have to make huge payments, and that ended up weakening the Seleucid Empire eventually, which brings us to the Third Macedonian War. <laughs> okay, 172 B.C. So Philip died in 179, and his son Perseus decided to expand the empire. Um, he, he, he made an attempt to assassinate one of Rome's allies, and Rome declared war on Perseus. In the pa Battle of Pinda in 168, the Romans won, and 
they divided Greece into four client states. So that was the, th the third Macedonian War. Now, we're going to talk about Antiochus Epiphanes. He was uh, a leader of this Seleucid Empire. He was born in 215 BC. And um, he, was a, he was one of the political hostages in Rome of the king's family. And uh, under the Treaty of Apamea. In 170 BC, Ptolemy V's guardians, they, the child king, his guardians declared war on the Seleucids. And they lost the first battle against Antiochus IV. And Antiochus invaded Egypt. And he captured Ptolemy V, the child king. And Rome was busy in the Third Macedonian War at this time. So Antiochus allowed Ptolemy V to rule as a puppet king, and he had to rule from Memphis, which was, there's Alexandria, which was sort of the capital, but Memphis is over in this area a bit more, a smaller place. So he couldn't rule from the capital, he had to rule from Memphis. And after Antiochus withdrew from Egypt, um, a Alexandria set up a second king. It was Ptolemy V's brother. So Ptolemy V is in Memphis, and they set up his brother as a king in Alexandria. And then the two brothers united together and as joint rulers of Egypt, and they ignored the Seleucids. So in 168 BC, Antiochus IV led a second attack into Egypt. And he also sent a fleet to attack Cyprus. And on his way there, his path was blocked by a Roman ambassador named Gaius Papilius Laonis. And the Roman ambassador told him to draw his armies out of Egypt and Cyprus, or be at war with Rome. And Antiochus said he would discuss it with his council. But uh, the, the ambassador drew a circle around him in the sand with a stick. And he said, before you cross this line, I need an answer to give to the Roman Senate. So Antiochus ended up having to agree and withdraw his army and his fleet. So that's where we get the saying that drawing the line in the sand is from that event. Now, some people would say from that event Antiochus was enraged. Um, but other historians will say, well, why would he be enraged? He, he actually gained. He didn't have to go to war against Egypt. And he, and he didn't lose any of his own kingdom. And uh, he didn't have to go to war against Rome. But what he did was he went back. And I think what it was, was he wanted to strengthen Jerusalem or Judea uh, as a, his own possession. Because... They were always being conquered by Egypt or by Syria, back and forth, back and forth, because they had a different religion, and they were a different people. So they were never a part of this kingdom, and they were never a part of this kingdom. They were just owned by them. And so Antiochus, I guess he figured, I'm going to make them Greek. I'm going to make them like our kingdom. And now they will, that way they will be my subjects forever. I can't subjugate them if they have a different religion. So he, he started making moves to bring Jerusalem under his control. He banned Jewish religious practices. And he offered swine's flesh on the, uh, on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, which desecrated the temple. This, they say this is the abomination of desolation. The Jews would, would interpret it this way. And some Christians also. 
He set up a pagan cult in the temple in Jerusalem. Um, and he, he built gymnasiums and started to bring Greek culture into Judea. And a lot of, a lot of the Jews actually uh, went along with it and became Greek. They, they, bec- they took on the Greek religion and went along with it, you know. Uh, but there was a certain family, Judah Maccabee, in 167. Uh, he began a civil war among the Jews, um, forcing the Jews that had converted into Greek ways, forcing them to become Jewish again. This is what the civil war was about. Okay? And there was a lot of Jews who, s- they... they they wanted to continue to to be with the Seleucid Empire because they wanted peace, and I guess they thought, well, it's just too hard to be a Jew, and they they so they actually fought to be in the Greek Empire. That was sort of back and forth, and the Maccabees ended up winning in the end. And in 167, Judah Maccabee and his family revolted, and they, they gained momentum for a few years. The Persians attacked the Seleucid Empire from this side. The Persians are over here, right? They started attacking the, the Seleucid Empire. So the king, um, Antiochus IV, he left his general in charge over the, to fight the Jews while he traveled back here to take care of this revolt over here. Now in 161, Judas Maccabee, he made a a vague agreement with Rome for protection. Rome kind of wanted to interfere with the Seleucid affairs, but they were not yet really committed to doing all this. So they, they made an agreement, but they didn't really come behind it really strongly. Judas Maccabees was killed in the Battle of Elassa in 160 BC and his uh, son Jonathan became the leader. Then when now we have the fourth Macedonian war. About 150 BC there's a pretender to the throne Andrisus and he tried to reunite the old kingdom of Macedon. Remember the Romans divided it into four, four kingdoms. He tried to reunite them into one kingdom. And then the Romans attacked. <laughs> and they uh, they won at the second battle of Pandia. And the Achaean League declared war on Rome. And Rome wins. And Rome, Rome divides Macedonia into two new Roman provinces. Achaea and Epirus. So this red part here is Epirus. You can see down here, Epirus. And and this this is the other province. So that was the end of the Fourth Macedonian War. In 134 BC, John Hyrcanus, which is one of the Maccabee kings of Judea, he joined an alliance with Antiochus VII. So Antiochus IV is gone now, right? And Judea is kind of a kingdom of its own. It's a little kingdom in here, okay? And they entered an, he, he entered an alliance with the, with the Seleucid king until 129. And, uh, and at that time, the Seleucid king, Antiochus VII, died. And the Hasmonean kingdom just stopped offering tributes because the Seleucid Empire's power was shrinking and they figured, well, we don't need you anymore. So they just stopped giving them money. And the Hasmonean dynasty grew and it it got bigger and bigger. Down in here, there was uh, the Edomia, which is the Edomite kingdom. They were taken over by the Jews and forced into Judaism. And they had a few wars with Petra here, the Nabataeans. 
And they took a lot of their cities too in here. Now the Hasmonean dynasty in Judea, it reached its apex about 76 to 67 BC. Under That was the time of Queen Shalom Alexandria. Under her rule, the Sanhedrin Council was formed. So, or it was probably started to be formed before that, but it, it really was made solid in her rule, and it became actually a part of the government. The Sanhedrin Council, just before that, like it was during the Maccabean period that the Pharisees and Sadducees became like two political parties, kind of, about... Yeah, we're going to do the law of Moses, but then there's different opinions about how to do the law of Moses and what laws should be made and how the people should be governed under the law of Moses. So it's, it's sort of like two political factions debating those things. And the Sanhedrin Council became like a house of parliament with Pharisees and Sadducees maybe voting over, um, voting and debating these types of uh, topics. And then the king would look to them for counsel and advice over setting policies. So under Queen Salom Alexandria, this became really entrenched in into the Jewish, uh, into the Judean kingdom N and they started enacting many laws regarding Torah um, how to follow the Torah now when the queen died her two sons started a civil war one was named Aristobulus and the other one was Hyrcanus the second okay so Hyrcanus ruled for about three months and then uh, Aristobulus overthrew him and he ruled from 67 to 63. Now, there was a guy uh, named Antipater. Antipater, he was an Edomian, or an Edomite, who had been, uh, I think his father was forced into Judaism. So Antipater kind of grew up in this... Um, forced conversion situation where the Edomites, uh, you know, they went along with it, but not all of them were really willing and, and they were always l looking for an opportunity to overthrow the Jews and, and do their own thing again. So Antipater was kind of like this kind of guy. He was an Edomite, but he started to be in very involved with p the political life in Judea. So Antipater, he began to counsel Hyrcanus II, the brother who was overthrown. And he began to say that your brother is planning to murder you. You have to do something about it. And so he convinced Hyrcanus II to take refuge in Petra, in, in the uh, Nabataean kingdom. And... And he promised Aretas, the king of the Nabataeans, to, to return to him the towns that were taken by the Judeans. Okay, so Aretas ended up taking 50,000 soldiers and besieging Jerusalem and using Hyrcanus II as the king who was besieging Jerusalem. He was like the puppet that they were using as to say to the Jews, open up and surrender. This is Harkanus taking over. But it was all Arabs. The whole army was Arabs. And they refused to open for him, obviously. And uh, there was a siege that went on for for several months. 
And during this civil war, the Roman general Marcus Aemilius Scarus, he came to Syria here because Syria had become very weak because the Persians from the east were, were weakening it a lot. The Romans had weakened it from this side and the Jews had weakened it from this side. And the Romans were coming to take possession of the kingdom, of the Seleucid kingdom. It was much smaller at that time. It, w it would have been like this big because it had been entrenched on every side. So the Romans had beaten them out and was coming to take possession. In an, and, and this man, Marcus Aemilius Scarus, he was like a, an ambassador uh, coming to take possession in the name of Pompey the Great. And then both the Hasmonean brothers, Aristobulus and Hyrcanus II, because Jerusalem was under siege, and they were at a stalemate, both of them appealed to this Roman general to help. And each one was offering him gifts. Uh, Scarus, the Roman general, he decided in favor of Aristobulus. And Aretas, uh, the Nabataean king, was forced to withdraw from Jerusalem. But in 63 BC, Pompey came to Syria. Pompey the Great, the Roman general. or He was like one of the three leaders of the triumvirate. So um, when Pompey came to, the Syri to Syria, he decided to bring Judea under Roman control. He thought... I'm going to take over Judea. <laughs> he already had Egypt, perfect treaty with Egypt, treaties with everybody. He didn't have a treaty with them. So he said, I'm going to come and take over Judea. So Pompey, he ended up favoring Hyrcanus II. And Aristobulus revolted against him. But Pompey debated uh, defeated Aristobulus, taking several cities. Aristobulus surrendered, but p the people in Jerusalem would not open the gates to Pompey, the Roman. But Judea, uh, Pompey besieged the city and he captured it. And that's the time when he entered into the temple and he entered into the Holy of Holies. And I guess as the legend goes, he just peeked in to the Holy of Holies and he saw there was nothing to plunder the, in there. There's no ark. All the temple to furnishings had been taken. So there wasn't much to see. And he just said, well, we'll just leave it alone. Um, he was the second one besides the high priest. The first one was uh, a, a Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth who had offered swine's flesh on the altar, right? So Judea then became a protectorate of Rome at that time under Pompey. And they were allowed a king under the administration of a Roman governor. Aristobulus was taken prisoner to Rome. Hyrcanus II was made the high priest with no political power. Julius Caesar supported Aristobulus over Hyrcanus and Antipater. Aristobulus was taken to Rome, and I guess when he was being favored by Julius Caesar, then uh, Pompey, some people working for Pompey, poisoned him in Rome. And... Uh, Civil war broke out between Julius Caesar and Pompey at that time. And Antipater, Antipater, remember him, the Edomite? He counseled Hyrcanus II to put his so support behind Pompey. Pompey was ruling up in this area, right? He, own, he was controlling all this area. Caesar had Egypt. 
Caesar had not did not yet have Egypt, but he was moving into Egypt. Okay, so um, Antipater counseled Hyrcanus to support Pompey, but when Pompey was murdered, Antipater took an army and ran quickly to help Julius Caesar against Alexandria, because Caesar was having problems. Uh, taking over Alexandria. So Antipater runs in there with, a, with an army and helps him. And um, in 47 BC, after the Julius Caesar kind of wins the war in Rome and he becomes, you know, the big shot in Rome, um, he made Hyrcanius II, the high priest, in Judea, and Antipater was made the Roman procurator over Judea. So <laughs> Antipater becomes the Roman governor of Jube Judea, and Hyrcanus II is the priest in the temple. And Antipater ended up setting up his sons. He divided the Judea into four, four sections and put his four sons in charge of each section. Herod the Great was one of his sons. He, 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 put, he was put in charge of Galilee. Um, Phazael was the governor of Jerusalem. And I'm not sure what the other two were, but those were the important ones. So, now from 49 to 45 BC, during the Civil War between Julius Caesar and Pompey, so they're fighting here. Pompey's on this side, Julius Caesar's in here, and they're fighting, okay? Cleopatra the Seventh. she was the queen of Egypt, she sided with Caesar, Julius Caesar. Now after Caesar's assassination, Cleopatra the seventh sided with um, with Mark Antony against Pompey, right? Uh, Mark Antony controlled the Eastern Roman Empire way over here, France, Spain, that kind of area. So in 30, 32 to thirty B.C., Cleopatra and Mark Antony fought against Octavian. And then at the Battle of Actium, which was a naval battle up in here somewhere, the uh, Cleopatra's fleet was defeated by Octavian. In 30 BC, Octavian invaded Egypt at the Battle of Alexandria. Antony and, Cle and Cleopatra committed suicide in Egypt. Um, now, you know, we've heard all them stories where she took the poison of a snake and when he saw that she was dead, he was so upset that he poisoned himself also. There's a few different versions of it. They might have been just butchered by Octavian and, and they made up the story to please the Romans, right? They were suicided. <laughs> or who knows, like... There's a few different versions of that, Mark Antony and Cleopatra. It's I think there's a Shakespearean play, too, about it, right? So then Octavian took Egypt as his own personal possession. And in 27 BC, Octavian obtained the name Augustus, and Egypt became an imperial province. And... The emperors of Rome ruled Egypt as a Roman pharaoh from that time. So every Roman emperor from that time for the next 300 years held the title as the pharaoh of Egypt. And the priesthoods in ancient Egypt and Ptolemic Egypt, um, so there was gods of ancient Egypt with their priesthoods, and there were also Greek gods from 
Ptolemic Egypt with their priesthoods. They were allowed to keep their temples, except they had to add Roman imperial temples. So like the emperor cults where they're worshipping Caesars, they, they added that to e Egyptian worship. So, so this kind of leads up into where Rome, first Rome took, in, took over Macedonia. These are the four horns of that beast in the leopard beast, you know, in, uh, in the book of Daniel. So Rome took over this one, took over this one, took over this one, took over this one. Rome took over all four of those horns, except maybe not this end of it. But you see, the Persians took that. Rome took what was left of it. So now we got the situation when Jesus Christ comes on the scene. Rome owns all of this, all of this, and they also own Judea. And Judea has a king under a Roman governor. And Herod the Great, who is the son of Antipater, he became the governor over, because he killed all his brothers. He, he became the governor over Rome. Pontius Pilate was the governor and Herod, Herod the Great was the king, the king of Judea. Pontius Pilate was the governor. So it was a little bit convoluted too, uh, the stories of that. So this is how, how things occurred. And then we have Jesus Christ was crucified in Jerusalem and um, he said of, of the temple, not a stone shall be left upon a stone that shall not be thrown down. And he said to the Jews, your kingdom is left to you desolated. And it was in 70 AD that the Jews revolted against the Romans and the Romans moved in with their, their legions and besieged Jerusalem and destroyed the temple ban the Jews from the whole country, um, exiled the Jews. So these are very important um, moments in history when you're talking about prophecy. So now, okay, tell, let's take a look at this. So Daniel chapter 7, up until the end of the book, those are prophecies given personally to Daniel. Uh, prophecies before that were given to the Persian king or the Babylonian king. These ones are given from here on are given to Daniel, right? I, Daniel, had a dream, okay? Um, as this dream was for Daniel. And it's the four beasts, okay? And, he's, and then he asked the angel... Uh, he asked them, what, what does all this mean? And he told me, and he made me know the interpretation. And he said, these beasts are four, which are four kings, sh which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. There, that was his answer. That is what this whole vision means. There's four beasts, and then the saints of the Most High will possess the kingdom forever and ever. Okay? So then in, then Daniel asks in particular about the fourth beast, which was more diverse from the others, different from the other three, and it was more dreadful. And then he gives them a more detailed look at the fourth beast. So now... When we particularly look at this one about the fourth beast, right? He shall speak, starting in verse 25, He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So the Jews, they interpret this as Antiochus Epiphanes. When he came into the temple, he offered swine's flesh, forced all the Jews to become like Greeks and worship Greek gods, and change times and laws. So 
they shall be given into his hand for three and a half times or three and a half years. That was basically the time Antiochus Epiphanes did this. So does a lot of uh, Christians also will say that that's what this means. That's what this prophecy is about, right? But judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his ob- his dominion to consume and destroy it to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and greatness under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Well, that's not what happened. See, this is why a lot of the secular Bible studying types will say that this is a failed prophecy, because Antiochus Epiphanes did that, but it, he didn't, the saints didn't inherit the kingdom forever because the Jews were actually expelled from the land of Israel. They didn't inherit the kingdom. Like, But a Christian, a Christian will have a different view of this. The saints of the Most High inheriting the kingdom forever, that is what the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the, go, the going out of the gospel. That is the saints of the Most High inheriting the kingdom forever. This is Daniel chapter 7 we're looking at. So, now this beast will say, take a look. Um, and bam, bam, bam. Where's the angel start? Thus he said. So here's how he talks about the fourth beast. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom upon the earth, which is diverse from all kingdoms. It's different from all kingdoms. Now, was Antiochus IV different from any of the other kingdoms? Not really. Like, in what way was he different? He was different towards the Jews, but I think any other kingdom would have um, been that way towards the Jews. Um, I think Rome is different from all other kingdoms because it became a republic. It wasn't a kingdom, it was a republic. Okay? And it shall devour the whole earth. Did the Seleucid Empire devour the whole earth? No. Rome did. In ancient times. And you could look at it as now also. Look at uh, the Club of Rome. They're like an elite club over in Rome somewhere that kind of set policy for global globalists, you know. So that has a, is more fulfillment than Antiochus is. And he shall dread, tread down and break in pieces the earth. And the ten horns are ten kings. Okay. Um, he shall speak great words against the Most High and wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. And now, okay, Antiochus Epiphanes did this in Jerusalem for three and a half years, okay, which is the Jewish interpretation. Then it says, But judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, and consume and destroy it to the end, and the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Well, the Jews were expelled from Judea. So, that didn't really happen that way. But, this, when we look at this as at the time of the end, and this, this great beast that takes over the whole earth, um does all these things against God during its rule and then the end comes and the kingdom and the dominion and greatness under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall sur- serve and obey him. That's the messianic era and this is the end of the matter. Okay, so you can see what I'm getting at here is there's there's different ways to interpret this these prophecies now what I did here is I um, I kind of uh,
put these prophecies together where this one here is Daniel chapter 7, this column. The second column here is Daniel chapter 8. And the part that's in pink here, this is the angel's answer, where I kind of broke the prophecy up into different parts and gave the angel's answer. For This is the angel's first answer in Daniel chapter 7. Now I put it here because it's easier to, to get than later on. But these four great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. That's what this whole prophecy of chapter 7 is about. Okay. Now in chapter 8, this is the prophecy of the he-goat um, hitting the ram. And that is... Alexander the Great attacking the Persian Empire. Okay, see now, now this this prophecy, the angel said, "Understand, son of man, that at the time of the end is, is this vision. The ram you saw, the lord of the pair of horns, are the kings of Media and Persia, and the hairy goat is the king of Greece, Javan." And the great horn between his eyes is the first king, which is Alexander the Great. Okay, so that's the 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 ram, the the gro the goat striking the ram. Okay, then we go down here to the next part. Still, this is chapter seven, and this here is chapter eight. Okay, and then the the. The he goat became very great, Alexander the Great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And there came up from under it four um, obvious horns towards the four winds of the heavens. Okay, and the angel's interpretation, and the, it was broken, and the four stood up from under it. Our four kingdoms from the nation will stand up, but not in his power, not in Alexander's power. In their own power. Because they took his kingdom and divided it up. Okay. And this is the third beast in ta chapter 7. The leopard. That's the four, right? He, uh, A leopard which had on upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads. And dominion was given to it. So this is an earlier prophecy. It's more vague. This is chapter 8. This next prophecy, it's more detailed. Okay? It's showing the four kings who stood up. Now, from here, we match up the prophecies. The, the fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. And from one of them came out a little insignificant horn. Okay? From one of them came out a little in, in, insignificant horn. And he became great. So did Antiochus the Great come out from one of them? One of the four? Or was he one of the four? I think he was one of the four. He didn't come out from the four. He was one of the four. So from out of them came a little one. So what I'm thinking is that when we're looking at this there's this little insignificant one over here coming out from one of them he came out from there he had a treaty with them he had a treaty he beat these guys took over that had a treaty with this one the whole time Went to war with this one, defeated it because it was being attacked from the other side. He defeated it and then he took over um, then he took over Judea, which was kind of a part of this empire. It was like a almost a satellite kingdom, but they did gain independence for a while. 
and then he took over Egypt. He was allied with Egypt and ended up taking it over completely. So all of this became Roman land. So this is the one that took over the whole earth. This guy here took over the whole earth. This guy didn't take over the whole earth. He lost the whole earth. If you call this the whole earth, he lost it. This guy here, he started with this and took over all of it. He took over Carthage, took over this, 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 and, and even more. Like all... And, and it even to this day, Rome has an influence. To this day. We'll talk about that later. There's a, there's a few ways, many ways, that Rome has an influence to this day. So let's get back to this now. We're going down. Okay, now we're, stu we're still looking at Daniel chapter 7 in this column. Daniel chapter 8 in this column. And then this column is Daniel chapter 9. We're going to start bringing this in. I've already done a video on this. Um, I think I probably could do a better video on it. Which I will probably next video. So we'll do a, we'll do a video on this next, but um, right now we're just going to co concentrate on Daniel chapter seven and eight regarding this history. Okay. Okay. So they beheld the thrones were cast down. The ancient of days sat, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery f flame, and the wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Judgment was set and the books were open. So this vision is right up until Judgment Day. Okay? So thus says the angel. The angel is interpreting it. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which is diverse from all kingdoms. It's a republic, not a kingdom. And shall devour the whole earth. So who's a republic now that, uh, you know, likes to make peace and treaties all over the world, right? And shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns are ten kings that shall arise. We'll get to that later. Um... And he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This little horn, this power. And he'll think to change times and laws. So what are laws? Well, you got the Ten Commandments, right? The times are the holy days. The, 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 the Sabbath, the Passover, those are the times. The laws are the Ten Commandments. So, is there a, an entity that has different holy days than God's and different Ten Commandments than God's? Well, yes, there is. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and half a time. And they shall take away his dominion. Judgment will sh sit. And they will take away his dominion and consume and destroy it. This thing's, this thing's dominion. They will consume and destroy it to the end. And it's being slowly destroyed and consumed. Just by knowledge and common sense. And the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That's judgment day, right? When the, the kingdom of Christ is finally brought in. So Daniel chapter 8. Um, and from one of them. One of the four. Came out a little insignificant horn. And he became exceedingly great. To the south. 
and to the east and to the glory. Now the King James Bible will say to the glorious land. The word land is not there. It's just a noun. And it says the glory. To the glory. Okay. So he became exceedingly great to the south and to the east and to the glory. Well, let's take a look. This one here became exceedingly great to the south and to the east and to the glory. And what is to the glory? Well, you could look at it that he took he he took over Judea, but how about he killed Jesus Christ, he expelled the Jews, and took over the Christianity. He took over the whole gospel to the glory. He 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 became exceedingly great to the south and to the east and to the glory. The glory of God, right? So he, he, he becomes this force that is standing up in opposition to the glory of God. Okay. And he became great up to the host of heavens. Well, we got saints, right? The host of the heavens, okay? How many saints are there? A couple of thousand saints. The saint of this, the saint of that. You get, uh, you pray to this saint if you lost something. You pray to that saint if you um, want a wish to come true. You pay, there's a saint for everything, right? You pray to everyone but Jesus. Okay? Became great up to the host of the heavens. He caused to fall to the earth from the host and from the stars, and he trampled them. That's a bit deeper. I'll get to that later. And to the captain of the host, he made himself great. To captain, and who's the captain of the host? Well, to a Christian, that's Jesus Christ. But his mother, right? His mother's greater than he is, right? As some people will say. Up to the captain of the host. He made himself great. And from him, the continual was exalted. What's the continual? The continual is the daily sacrificial offerings in the temple. It was a, that's, that's the continually. So the continual priesthood. Okay. Um, the, the, um, so who's now offering a continual offering uh, that, that claims to be um, taking over the job of the Levites and sitting in the temple that they built and doing continual offerings daily, okay? And the holy place was thrown down. Well, who threw down the holy place, the temple in Jerusalem? Who threw it down? And a host was given to her. Her. Who's her? This horn. This. This. Now it's become a woman, right? Now it's become a female. And a host was given to her. So this kingdom becomes a church. Her is a church. When you, when you're talking about prophetic things, her is a. Uh, um, a, s a service to a, a, a service system of service to God or a, a religion okay and a host was given to her upon the continual upon the the uh, offering daily offering the breaking of bread right and in rebellion and she, she threw truth down to the ground. And she acted and she was successful. Okay? And what's the angel say about this? Okay? He explains this. In the end of their kingdom, the four horns, right? 
as the transgressors are complete. A king will stand up of fierce countenance, understanding riddles. Okay? Understanding riddles. Drawing lines in the sand, maybe. Um, knowing what's going on, making treaties with all these kingdoms, knowing what's going on in all of them, more than they do. And he will be mighty in power, but not by his power. Because it will be a republic, right? He's representing a power. And extraordinarily, he will corrupt, destroy, and prosper, and act, and he will destroy numerous and holy people. How many people have been, uh, how many genocides of holy people? What happened in Europe. Not only that, in uh, the uh, when they when they um, made the Holy Roman Church in the third century, they wiped out any other Christians that did not go along with it, and they continued to do that. Okay. And upon his discretion, he will cause deceit to prosper in his hand. And in his heart, he shall become great. Oh yeah, real great, right? And by peace, he shall destroy many. And he shall stand against the captain of captains, Jesus Christ. And in the end, his hand shall be broken. That means his ability to do anything will be, he, he will lose his ability to do these things. But he'll still be there because he's going to be exposed, right? The unveiling. And the vision of the evening and the morning that was told, it is true. So he goes into another thing. So. We can start to see like how this Antiochus Epiphanes interpretation doesn't really measure up. It just doesn't measure up. This is Antiochus Epiphanes. He owned this. And from his time onwards, it shrunk and shrunk and shrunk and was absorbed into Rome. So it doesn't fit the prophecy. And and Judea also it was like a flash in the pan. It, it it did not really become all that great, and it didn't take over the whole world. It didn't. It was uh, a time in history that was probably less than the first kingdom period. Um, they were subject puppets of these states they had very little uh, autonomy and um, they lost the temple eventually they lost the city they lost the whole country up until 1948 um, so it doesn't really fit in with the prophecy so well as Jesus Christ does and Rome now well, as I look at it, we're going to go into a lot more detail getting into verse uh, or chapter 11 and 12 in Daniel, 10, and 10 to 12. Um, but what I wanted to do for this video is just to get aware of all of this history. And so that we can start picking out, like, who is this talking about? Who is this, this dark power? that arises out of this era. There's a dark power that arises and takes over the whole world. Now some people will say, oh, it's the Jews, right? They're running the world. There's that. But some will say it's Rome. They're running the world. So who killed Jesus? Rome and the Jews. Not the Jews. The government power, uh, the Sanhedrin, the the, that that leadership of the Jews, I wouldn't, 
I wouldn't conflate it onto Jewish people. The, I wouldn't even conflate it onto Italian people either, or even Roman Catholic people. Um, they're just um, in ignorance supporting these powers. So we're only talking about these powers. Okay? So these, I'm not making any definite interpretation, but I'm saying these powers are the powers we've got to look at, these two. That one and that one. For who is this fourth kingdom, this kingdom of darkness? So when we get into the details in later parts of Daniel, this is what we're going to be talking about. So this is what I wanted to introduce here was this. This is what it's talking about. Something about this. <clears throat> okay. So, don't forget to um, subscribe and like this video and uh, hit the notification bell. Make sure you get my next video because I'm not putting them out regularly anymore. Not for another year, maybe. But I'm going to put them out when I can and they're probably going to be long ones like this. And I hope you can see why I didn't want to break it up. You can watch it in different times and just come back to it. Um, just note down the time stamp where you left off and watch a bit at a time. But I feel like it's a message that kind of belongs in one video. Um, it's complicated. There's a lot to absorb. Um, I've been looking at this for many years. And I'm sort of, every time I go through it, I learn more about it. So, so I'm just giving a bit of focus on what are we focusing on when we're reading more of this because we're going to look next at Daniel chapter 9 and that is about the crucifixion of Christ it is absolutely about that um, don't let anyone fool you thinking oh there's a big gap theory and you know the gap is you know it's not 70 weeks it's 69 weeks plus a huge gap plus one week. That, that's crap. Um, it has an interpretation. And that one is one of the easier parts to interpretate, interpret. Um, we'll get to that in the next video when I get a chance. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.